Well, let's answer some questions from Sunday's Market Outlook. First one, revisited a video you did in April 2020 when oil went negative and you mentioned there's nowhere else to go other than S&P 500. How do you balance that long-only viewpoint with the current overvaluation with regards to your long position? Well, you can't really compare the two, the two times. April 2020, interest rates were 0%. Our Fed funds rate was, what, 0.2? Uh, it is now 5.33. So there is a return to cash. In April of 2020, there was no return to cash, and the Fed was squeezing. Uh, they were buying long-term treasuries, so they were squeezing all yield out of the bond market. There was no other place to go. You had no choice. You weren't going to get anything uh, in cash. You weren't going to get anything in bonds. They were taking all the return out. You had no choice. So they're not comparable. Uh, my strategy has been to just keep my weighted beta dollars in check and patiently wait for red days to sell puts across different asset classes. Yeah, that's fine. Um, it, when I say something four years ago, that doesn't mean it's a universal truth for now and forever. Uh, it is everything in this market. Everything is context dependent. Uh, and you have to put it in the time that you're in. Even... Something I might say a month ago uh, may be outdated based on where the market is today. So there is danger in saying, well, five years ago you said you liked this stock. What's going on? Well, that was five years ago, right? Uh, have you noticed that your knowledge has compounded over time, making it easier to learn and retain new information? Uh, yeah, yeah, that does that does work because the more you know, the easier it is to to learn something, learn something new because there is there is always overlap with uh, something new that you're learning and something you already know, for the most part. Apart from personal interest in a particular sector, what other factors should one consider before choosing a sector to specialize in? Uh, other than interest, uh, the ability to understand. You may be uh, very interested uh, in biology and human health. But when it comes to biotech, uh, you may not understand anything of what you're reading. So even though it's interesting, you may not understand it. So something that, that you have the ability to understand without having to take an undergrad degree in something, right? Did you choose real estate based purely on interest or was it by chance? Uh, well, no one's really interested in real estate. Uh, it just is uh, an asset class that performs well. Uh, and is related to interest rates. So it's, it's easy to understand, and because it was easy to understand, it's kind of a nice place to start. Uh, if you had to do it all over again and couldn't choose real estate, which sector would you pick? Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know what, uh, what, I, would have, what I would have picked. Uh, being that there was a whole bunch to pick from, I, I chose real estate just because it seemed to make a lot of sense. I probably would have picked something else that, that made a lot of sense, that was easy to understand. I don't know what it would have been, though. Do you have any thoughts on BMW after the recall announced last week? Well, this is what car companies do. They, they recall. This is quite common. Banks uh, get fines for bad behavior just as a matter of course of being in the banking industry it's just part and parcel of being in the bank industry part and parcel of being in the auto industry's recall so i don't really have any uh, any opinion on that <clears throat> shouldn't you be going short zq i've answered that so many times yeah short short zq and i am short uh, why should i buy stocks when i can buy leaps i can manufacture the dividend by playing theta I don't know what you mean by that. I, I mean, I, I know in my head what I would do, but I don't know in your head if you share the same thought that's in my head when you say you can manufacture the dividend by playing theta. Requires less capital, protects from the downside risk. Uh, okay, moreover, I'll be paying the risk-free rate less and less as rates are big. No, you won't. Well, I mean, if you continually keep buying, once you buy your first one, you've already paid the interest rate that was associated with pricing that out. 
I'll roll them say three months before expiration. What am I missing? Well, uh, right now it just costs a lot of money to get that done with uh, with the with the price of the option. And let's say that you uh, uh, you buy a whole bunch of leaps and you're one hundred percent invested. Uh, your portfolio is invested in leaps and you think, ah, I'm doing well and none of them pay off. You have a 100% loss, right? You, you, you have a time, a time in the sand where you can no longer afford to wait. When you say you'll roll them every three months, what if they're, what if they're all losing, right? You don't have the luxury of time. You don't have the ability to wait. Um, you know, you, you, you have limited options on what you can do. Um, uh, that would be about the only thing that I could see in, in buying these, uh, in buying leaps. I don't know that I would make it, a the only thing that I would do. Uh, it limits you, right? But uh, if, if, if you think that there's something there that you can, that you can do, go ahead. Um, but you got to be right. What if the market turns down? You bought all these leaps. Delta will take away your premium very quickly. And it drops and it drops. What are you going to do? All you can do is take a loss at that point, really. Or, or, or uh, continue to hold and hope that it recovers uh, to the strike price plus your premium by the expiration dates so you're making because I mean once the options worth zero to roll it requires you to spend even more money you're not getting money you 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 must spend money you can continuously roll short options but but you can't continuously roll long options because at some point you, you you just run out of money if if they're not winning uh, how do you find nav in a financial statement uh, kill them and inner rent. Well, these are IFSR companies, so uh, net asset value uh, will be pretty much the same as book uh, book value per share. So just take equity and divide by number of units, number of shares, and you'll have a very close proxy to NAV because uh, they're listed at fair value. The investment assets are listed at fair value, and the investment asset should be, I'd say, 90 more than 90% of total assets. Applied level. I'm from India. Emerging market. Security market is booming and I believe it is less informationally efficient market compared to U.S. Do you think we'll give more returns in options markets compared to U.S.? Uh, I don't know. Um, the return on the option it's going to be a function of, of two big things. The, the first thing is going to be the premium uh, that you get, which is uh, a function of the uh, implied volatility. Uh, and the return on the option is also going to be a function of the uh, change in price of the underlying. <clears throat> so you can have an informationally efficient market with no volatility, which means there's very little premium, so you have to get it all from change in the price of the underlying. Um, I, I guess, maybe, maybe not, maybe the same, maybe less, maybe more. Uh, there's nowhere near enough information here for just, just by saying that the, the stock prices are less informationally efficient gives me no indication of whether or not uh, the options would, <clears throat> uh, would have greater or less return. Plus, I know nothing about the liquidity or the availability of the options on, on underlyings. Do they mostly have options? Or are there only a few that have options? Is volume light? No idea. <clears throat> you said most important factor in consistently earning from capital markets, continuous education. What do you mean by that? What do I mean by that? Uh, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. I mean exactly what I mean by it. Is you're all you should always be learning. Always. Uh, you said there was a time when you are continuously learning new lessons and losing money. No, I didn't. Uh, I, I said, you know, you learn a lot. And um, every time you lose money, you learn a new lesson. You know, and you just get sick of learning new lessons after a while, right? <clears throat> it's it's not that I learned a lot and still lost money. It's that you lose money and then, and then you learn something new that you didn't know. How do you know you have learned all the lessons to be learned? You haven't. You, you will never know it all, ever. 
ever. You will be humbled again and again and again and again and again, and you will lose money every on, on trades every year for the rest of your life. Uh, <clears throat> you will never have a 100% record, ever. And even when you're 80 and have been doing it for 60 years, the market will teach you something new. There is no end. There is no end. There is no end. Um, so, uh, infinity. Infinity. Uh, because the markets are not complicated, they're complex. And there is no solution for a complex problem. <clears throat> so it can never be solved. Are you learning any new lessons nowadays? <clears throat> uh, yeah, um, every day. Every day you look at a new stock uh, or in, in a sector you haven't, <clears throat> that you uh, have no experience, you have, to, you have to get in there and you have to figure it out. So you, you must be learning every day. Whenever I see a documentary... Or any news, I see traders have so many screens and so many information on the screen. <clears throat> uh, is it necessary? Um, it depends on what it is you're doing. Um, if you are, are just, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, a professional retail investor, and you don't manage money for anybody, there really is no need for that. <clears throat> um, th that's, you know, somebody who's probably, uh, you know, taking orders uh, for clients in several markets and probably has different screens up in different markets so that they don't have to keep entering in tickers and looking things up. They have the most popular screens up. <clears throat> so it it's probably to facilitate the business that they're in as opposed to they need to look at all of those things. Uh, you said you'd be able to stretch across three seats on your AC flight. <clears throat> We use business class on uh, these intercontinental AC flights uh, with um, Air Transit. Yeah, yeah. Future rate curve reflects a joint probability of the normal path uh, for the Fed. <clears throat> normal, while well, the expected path for the Fed, where rates follow a steady trajectory, and an emergency path or recession hits prominently in the Fed to cut rates. Um. Well, I. I I don't think that anybody would disagree with that. I think at any point in time when you look at the curve, it is, <clears throat> you have to weight it. It is, uh, is this uh, reflecting uh, what the market expects the path of the short rate to be? Uh, uh, or, uh, you know, is it more weighted towards what they think the uh, path of the economy will be, thereby uh, influencing the path of the short rate? Uh, you know, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. <clears throat> Opinion on CL, uh, CLH, no idea. I don't know what it is. What is your view on the current inventory level of copper in China that keeps going up? Um, <clears throat> they did shut down some smelters um, because it, there was just too much capacity. So... Um, I don't know that I have an opinion on that. What about the EV absorption that seems to be going up in China, but most countries aren't ready to adopt the EV vehicle due to maximum distance of the vehicle? BYD growth in Southeast Asia is currently blocked by the grid that cannot support a growing EV chargers. What are your thoughts about it? I don't know that I have any thoughts on that. Um, <clears throat> I don't. I haven't given any of that any kind of thought at all. So off the top of my head. Uh, other than saying, oh, okay, um, I have no real thoughts on that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't even know what thought I would have. It, it's such a broad statement. You know, it's like me saying, what are your thoughts on, on gravity? Uh, well, what specifically, right? Uh, <clears throat> I don't know. Um, my thoughts on it versus, versus what? Uh, or I would say, you know, my thoughts on it in consideration of what though uh you know in, in terms of uh you know how i feel about copper miners in terms of how i think they're going to work off that inventory so, see it's it's such a broad question i don't know what you mean when you say what are your thoughts i'm not sure what what way you're leaning when you ask that question so i i don't know how to answer that other than to say I've not given it much thought at all. 
when I hear you answer what positions you have taken and why you have taken it feels like you know what you're doing and you're extremely confident <clears throat> um, <clears throat> well uh, I, I I think I, I think I know what I'm doing yeah uh, how are you so confident and have so much conviction well experience I would say is, is probably the big one I mean I've, I've been in this game for a long time I've been through quite a few cycles I you know I can I can spot uh, uh, you know if you're going through uh, you know the different sectors you can spot where opportunity would be you can spot where there's mispricing uh, or at least where you feel that something doesn't make a lot of sense do you consider you just can't be wrong after no oh god no my god no 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 you can be once you start thinking you can't be wrong you're setting yourself up to be very very wrong because once you start losing on a position you'll think but i'm not wrong i can't be wrong so i'm just gonna hold it no 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 what do you think about different investment books and their philosophies they talk about i don't read investment books do you recommend to spend time reading those? Not really. Not really. Is it possible to only to be only profitable and incur no losses? No. Impossible. No one, no one in this game has a 100% record. If they do, they're just not taking enough risk, which means they're underperforming. Uh, they're underperforming every market they're in because they're not taking they're just not taking enough risk. Uh, so no, it's 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 uh, even in any one given year, the best of the best. I don't think that there's anyone out there that has a 100% record in any year uh, that is at least performing in line with the market in any active way, using any active strategy. No one has a 100% record. You get comfortable with losses. It's going to happen. Uh, <clears throat> How do you know you have enough experience in capital markets? Learned all the lessons to be learned in the capital market. Well, I haven't learned all the lessons, and I don't know if I have enough experience. Um, all you can do is just look at, you know, am I making money? And am I making more than I could have made if I would have just bought, uh, you know, SPY and TLT in a 60-40 ratio? Uh, you know, if that's going to return 25% in a year, and I'm making 18%, well then, obviously, I'm not doing very well. So, you know, as long as I look at what I'm earning based on the time that I'm putting in, if I'm doing better than the passive strategy, then then that's fine. Last well, Q&A, you told the same daily habits to follow to be good at anything. When asked about what daily habits to follow to be good in finance, can you elaborate? Well, I don't think I need to. I mean, I, I think you know the answer to this, right? Uh, the to 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 be good at anything requires you to put in the time. I think you you must know that. Uh, there is no secret. If you're you know following some pathway, trying to find you know the fountain of youth or or the elixir of life, they don't exist. There is no secret that that uh, you know uh, uh, an elite club uh, is holding back and not letting the world know, and that it's super super easy if only everyone knew this one secret. There is only one only one pathway and that's putting in the time period <laughs> that's it no matter what a uh, uh, different gurus want to sell you or tell you uh, that there's the secret or the one thing or this is the thing you're missing there's nothing it's 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 time it's the one thing we all have the same amount of 24 hours in a day it's the one thing in 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 which the clock is uh, indifferent to identity. It does not care who you are. It gives you 24 hours in a day, period. Everyone, that's the one thing we all have in equality. And it is probably the most misused thing which leads to all the inequality. Putting in the time. <laughs> there is no substitute. There is no shortcut. How do you have so much knowledge and confidence in finance? Well, these questions seem to repeat. Like anyone asks you a question, how can I, how can I develop it? I'm 25. Well, you're 25. If a, if a six-year-old said to you, wow, you know so much. Uh, how can I know what I'm six? You would say, wow, 
Give it time. You'll learn it as you go along. You're just too young right now, uh, 25. You're just beginning to see the world. You got a whole beautiful journey ahead of you, right? When when you get to 55, somebody 25 will say the same thing to you. It is uh, there is no substitute uh, for experience, right? It just and life. It just takes time. Would you say investing and trading are like betting and gambling? Nope. No, I would not. No, I would not. Gambling, I know the odds. Uh, before I roll the die, uh, or the dice, if I'm playing craps and I need a seven, I know the odds. I know the odds. With two dice, seven comes up six times out of 36. I know the odds ahead of time. I'm playing, I'm playing known probability distributions. Uh, in investing, you're not. You're not, you don't know the odds. You don't know the probabilities. Uh, you have to determine them for yourself. And somebody may have in their head a different distribution of outcomes that you have. So no, it is not like betting or gambling. The market is more like chess. If you want to use an analogy of a game, it is more like chess uh, than a casino game. How, uh, although some people do treat it like a casino. So that's not saying that the market's uh, can't resemble a casino. Uh, some people treat it as a casino. But when I go in a casino, I am playing probabilities and that's it. When I'm in the market, well, there's other things other than probabilities because I can disagree with the probability distribution that the market seems to suggest exists. Uh, addition of more countries being a great way to bring a global perspective. India is the fifth largest economy. Yeah, I, I, I don't know enough about India to, to really... To really poke into it, so I'm just I'm just going to I'm just going to avoid it. I don't think on YouTube there is a shortage of of uh, uh, you know um, Indian uh, uh, citizens uh, actually talking about the Indian economy. So I, I think you could find somebody who knows a lot more about it than I do. Increasing money market funds. Have you looked at the percent of total assets? No. I mean, there is something to think about there, right? Uh, if if money markets uh, represent, uh, you know, if if the proper allocation in a portfolio is five percent cash, uh, and uh, money markets uh, represent five percent of the total value of all assets, and the value of all assets is increasing, you would expect to see that. Yeah, I uh, I agree with that. I have not looked at it, but at six point something trillion. Mm, I do. I do sort of think it. Um, uh, it probably would have an overweighting today. Uh, in your rig chart, referring to drilling rigs or oil rigs production. Mm, I didn't put a rig chart up. Drilling rigs or oil rigs. I. Um, I, I presented the Baker Hughes rig count. Uh, I think the first number is oil rigs. The second number is all rigs. Uh, but I didn't put a chart up of rigs. All right. Uh, let's see. I have the same confusion when pundits talk about PPI who don't delineate between PPI final demand or PPI intermediate goods. A PPI chart from your uh, from your chart provider simply says PPI. Whenever PPI is quoted, it is always final demand. It is always final demand, which is just the opposite side of CPI. Uh, the intermediate uh, indexes, uh, there's you know stage one all the way to stage four. Those aren't reported because there are four separate stages, but there is only one final demand. Final demand goods, final demand services. It's measured once. Um, if you if they were reporting PPI for the intermediate stages, well, you'd have to have four different ones for stage one all the way to stage four. So whenever whenever you see PPI, it is always in terms of final demand. Looking at ABR, I will need to wait until the 4th of October to lock in a game due to personal account dealing rules. Wondering if I should just hold it over the long term for the dividend or at least wait until October 25th for any DOJ news. Uh, I like the prospect of deep value uh, and wonder if it's worth switching into another idea more in line with that for now. Um... Oh, I'm. I guess I'd ask where you got the October twenty fifth date. It was was did ABR uh, suggest that there was something pending on October twenty fifth, or did your options simply just expire October twenty fifth? 
think the 18th, October 18th the next is an expiration, so the 25th is an expiration as well, which would be one week before their earnings, I guess. I don't know. Um, if you don't already, you should set up a SIM pin on your phones for security. I don't know what that means. Set up a SIM pin on my phone for security. What do I need security for? Um, I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, well, I can't advise you on what to do on, on ABR. It's had another uh, another fairly decent day today. Uh, it seems to be responding well, but I seem to think the bigger risk event is going to be the Fed tomorrow. Um, I think it is uh, ABR has been responding to the move in the 10-year. Should release footage of the fight between you and the seller. It wasn't a fight so much as it was a shoving and pushing, <laughs> a shoving and pushing match. I got shoved once and I pushed back twice, uh, which is what you should do, right? It's what you should do. If somebody, you know, says hi to you, say hi to them. If somebody extends their hand to you, extend your hand to them. If somebody hits you, you hit them back twice as hard. And in doing that, you will prevent them from hitting the next person because then they'll think twice. You will prevent more victims from happening. Jesus had bad advice. Offer them the other cheek. You just create more victims. Somebody pushes you, you push them back twice as hard. That'll stop them. Uh, I mistakenly missed my question last time. You mistakenly missed. When should I buy applied level after level one or level two? Let's say I don't know anything about finance. I just want to understand everything you say. Um, well, the applied level has no expiration, so you can you can buy it at any time. Uh, when it first launched, I think it was ninety five dollars. Uh, some people originally paid ninety five dollars and still have it, and then the price I think went to um, two twenty. Uh, then it went to three twenty. Then it went to four forty. As I add more and more content. It doesn't make sense to keep it at the same price because I just keep adding more and more. I'm adding um, financial modeling now. Um, so by the time we get into next summer, into next July, with probably five or six more sub-industries added, five or six more uh, deep dives into different companies, two or three more uh, companies added to financial modeling, um, then you know it's time to think about, well, this is... It's not worth 440 anymore. It's worth something more uh, because of, of the content. So uh, the price will go up over time, and it is only one price. There is no, you know, you buy it once, there's no recurring fee. Uh, however, beginning October 1st, there will be on newer modules uh, that, that are layered on top of the applied level. I just don't know uh, um, when and where I'll introduce them, but there has to be something there. Where should I start learning finance if I don't know anything? CFA is a good start. CFA level one is a very good start. Yes. Uh, recently mentioned Capri is now fairly priced. Pretty much. Uh, but if the bank and the Kenyan is cutting, and I think it will because inflation today came in. Um, the the stats can inflation came in at 2%. The Bank of Canada inflation uh, metric, the one that they track, came in at 1.5%. Uh, and I think they, uh, they signal that they will be doing more cuts anyways. Uh, it's net asset value is going to keep rising. Yeah, yeah, well, be based on the fair value of the units. In other words, the cap rate will keep dropping. Yeah. Any reason to start unloading at mid fifties? Um, well, uh, I'm not unloading. Uh, I had a very large position, way too big, only because it was so undervalued. Once it gets to fairly valued or net asset value, it's like, well, I don't need a really large position anymore. I, I can live with a much smaller position because I still think uh, a Canadian apartment REIT still have some, some room to run, except the ones that have a lot of exposure to the Toronto area. There are just way too many condos uh, for rent. Uh, that are going to compete with all those apartment units. So, uh, you know, if you take all those condos that are for rent and you stack them into apartment buildings, you, you pretty much can create 
uh, easily 10 more uh, 600 unit apartment buildings in, in the Toronto area. <clears throat> so I, I, uh, I think that's the problem with Interrent and Minto, too much Toronto exposure, at least for Interrent. Um, I don't want, uh, you know, I'm not that excited about owning things that are fairly valued. I, I want to buy things that are undervalued. Could you clarify the long July 25? Short, 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 in case I think nobody listens to me. Eh? <laughs> several times uh, that one should manage risk. It was said several times one should manage risk and returns take care of itself. Correct. What specifically do you mean by risk management? Is it about beta? If that's how you manage risk, what kind of risk measure should one use? Oh, <clears throat> that's a whole PhD dissertation. Uh, it is however you define risk. Some people uh, define risk as their exposure to certain factors, beta being a big one. <clears throat> Some would say uh, that risk is uh, about not being invested enough. Um, some would say that uh, risk is, uh, uh, you know, difficult, you know, it, it would be difficult to quantify uh, because the, the outcome can only be one thing, but risk is a distribution. But you can never get the distribution, there will only be one outcome. So how can you possibly quantify, uh, how, how can you quantify it? Um, you got to pick something to measure it, and I, I, I seem to think that uh, the amount of money that you have invested in uh, a security that has some uh, uh, movement associated with the market, right? So, uh, what exposure to beta do you have? You weight them by dollars, and your delta. If you, this is if you have options. If you don't have options, then it's just dollar beta. But it's just how much dollar delta beta do you have? You know, and if you're making money and you're very good at picking things uh, and, you know, week after week after week you're making money, then increase the amount of dollar uh, 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 beta delta, dollar delta beta that you have because obviously it's working for you. But whatever you're doing, if you're losing money and you're losing money and you're losing money, then decrease that metric. Uh, how would you describe the catalyst for rate changes when interest rates change? Uh, usually the currency will change before the interest rate. I understand interest rate expectations affect LIBOR and LIBOR rates rising, dropping directly, make a currency strength and weaken. Well, there is no LIBOR anymore, but I get what you're saying. Some market reference rate, some interbank rate. <clears throat> I tried to grip the idea from level two derivatives on how both sides of the currency swap must equate. Um, I don't know that, that that's going to help you figure out the direction of, I mean, that's just a derivative, right? It's just, it's just about time value of money. I don't know that that's really going to, uh, uh help you with Forex <clears throat> or determining the direction of Forex. If a rate cut is fully expected like it is now in the U S and is already in uh, LIBOR rates, the actual cut might not even weaken the U.S. Correct. It's dependent on the expectations of further cuts and even some relative strengthening is possible. Correct. In other words, if interest rate path was going to be exactly as expected by the markets going forward, it, would affect it, it wouldn't affect FX rates at all. Correct. Or would the widening, narrowing interest rate differential still affect FX rate as time passes? Um... Well, y you, would, you would have a currency that would that would be on some pathway. However, let's say that you had uh, the U.S. path for the short rate look like this and the Canadian path for the short rate look like this. The differential may not change at all between the two, which means that it, if both uh, countries' um, short rate unfolded exactly along that forward curve, uh, the differential should be the attractor point on the valuation, but valuations between currencies can change for other reasons other than interest rate differential. Uh, it could change for uh, economic reasons. Uh, it could change for, uh, uh, you know, uh, the attractiveness of investment. Uh, it could change because of uh, the, 
uh, uh, current account status. Uh, if you're running a trade deficit for an extended period of time, you could trade based on uh, a change based on the level of geopolitical fear and the need for a safe haven asset like the U.S. dollar. <clears throat> so there are so many reasons why it could change. Okay. Difference between Fed funds future price term structure between current and settle. Oh, um, it's just when I take a snapshot. One is one line is just the beginning of the day. One line's the end of the day. So one, you know, one line is this is where it started, and the last line is where it settled. <clears throat> that's that's all it is. If I take the screenshot on Saturday instead of Friday night, there is only one line. Opinion on the amount of time you estimate is necessary to dedicate in order to maintain actively managed portfolio efficiently. Mm. Uh, okay, well, this is finance. Let's not use the word efficiency, right? That that does mean something very particular to mean variance optimization. To man it is, I think what you mean is effectively to maintain an actively managed portfolio effectively. No, it depends on market environment. Uh, and that it won't always require the same amount of time. I work full-time in wealth management, and I could dedicate five, six hours a week taking advantage of the two hours we have for lunch. I believe I have the knowledge to business myself and inform my... <clears throat> so uh, you'd be looking for uh, uh, either growth. You'd be looking for some factor, whether it be growth, whether it be quality, whether it be value, uh, and you would take longer positions. And you would say, look, I'm not going to play around with the options. What's the point of that? I'm, I'm not that interested. And, or if you do say, well, I'll sell puts on this one. Uh, well, you know, you got 30 days until they expire. It's not as if it requires, you know, eight hours a day, nine hours a day of staring at the screen. <clears throat> if you are staring at the screen eight, nine hours a day, you're doing it wrong. Uh, you shouldn't have to stare at the screen unless it's a very busy day. You know, there's just a whole bunch of red on the screen. Markets are plunging. Something's going on. Yeah, you're, you're going to keep your hand on the keyboard and your eyes on the screen because all sorts of beautiful things will go on sale and you're going to want to start nibbling away on days like that. Not loading up, but nibbling away on days like that in the hopes that, you know, it continues into the second and the third day. <clears throat> but for the most part, it's just a lot of noise during the course of the day. There are some days where, you know... I might check in a little bit in the morning, and then I go off on, on the day. I might check in at, you know, 3.45, 4 o'clock, <clears throat> and that would be about it. So uh, I think I answered that. I'm overwhelmed by the vast universe that exists and the hours that need to be dedicated to understanding each of them. Well, you're never going to know it all. You have, to, you have to, you know, pick and choose what you want to do. Another option is to index and forget about active management. Yeah, although giving up, aiming for returns greater than 20% seemed to me too high an opportunity cost. Um, <clears throat> it, it, most of my time is spent, um, you know, looking at things, uh, looking at the next thing. Uh, you know, what did I do this week? Look deeper into Intel and I look deeper into Oxy um, and, and, you know, finding finding some weakness or, or, or something in there and nothing really jumped out at me that says hey hey you forgot about this you, you know and, and in this environment that's this is going to be a killer <clears throat> so it's it's just a lot of time uh, researching things and looking at things and, and preparing for the next sell-off uh, but staring you know putting your chin in your hands and staring at all the little flashing lights on the screen that's that's for day traders uh, or for people who who don't know what they're doing you don't have to do that. Interested in the insurance subsector. Do you plan to create any content about this subsector? <clears throat> yeah, in time, yeah. Better to be sector specialist than a generalist. How could I know what sectors to specialize? What are you interested in? Which sector would you pick if you had to choose one to specialize? Um, <clears throat> it depends. Uh, real estate is always a winner. I think there's always an opportunity in real estate. It's just such a beautiful sector. It's it, it's it's very understandable uh, and um, easy. I mean, once you analyze one apartment REIT, you can analyze them all. Same with one office REIT, you can analyze them all. They're not so distinctly different. So, um, you know, finding relative value becomes really easy. It's just really easy to be there. Um, utilities are, are fairly straightforward and easy as well. 
Um, it depends. You know, it depends on where I want to be and what's going on and how willing I am to, to, to uh, you know, dive into a sector and learn new things. I don't know. Other than biotech and healthcare, I'm, I'm pretty open to almost anything. <clears throat> uh, 11 a.m. Tuesday, I see CME 61 in favor of 50 basis points cut. Are you worried uh, of your TLT short call? Nope. No, I am not worried. This is not a 50 basis point Fed. It is not a 50 basis point Fed. And retail sales today gave no indication that this economy needs emergency cuts. Now, keep in mind, in about two weeks, I think it's about two weeks from now, uh, on the east, on the west coast, all of the dock workers can strike. All of the dock workers, which means all the ships coming in, bringing all those goods from China over across the ocean. No way, no way. So you're going to have shortages, <clears throat> right? And shortages create price pressure. And you got that happening in two weeks. Uh, and the... Um, the word out of those negotiations is that it is it is more likely than not going to be a strike. More likely than not. <clears throat> uh, I guarantee you that's in, in the FOMC room right now, is that you have this potential out there. You know, do we really want to go 50 basis points in front of this? Why not go 25? And if they don't strike, you know, we, 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 we can go 50 the next time if, if need be. But we don't want to cut 50, have this happen, have inflation spike for two months, send the wrong signal to the market, and undo everything we've already done. This is not a, 20, a 50 basis point Fed. <clears throat> it is a 25 basis point Fed. Uh, <clears throat> can I ask if the uh, 2025 content will still be taught by you? No. Uh, I, the older readings that haven't changed, readings from year to year that haven't changed, my voice is still there, but not the newer readings, no. Uh, can I know the reason why you're not using valuation for your investment decisions? Because it's a lot of work to do. It's a lot of work, and I don't need to know a price target. I don't have to come up with a price target. I just have to have, as soon as I get the feeling there's a good story here, and that I can see value, and that management sees that it. It, it needs to do something to unlock that value <clears throat> and that they have a plan in place to get it done. If I see that, I'm good. I don't need to come up with a price target. One year rates at 4%, Fed funds futures 5.33. Why does 133 <clears throat> imply 10 cuts? Uh, because you have to wait it, right? <clears throat> so uh, let's uh, do a simple example. Let's say the Fed funds rate was 2% uh, and uh, we'll take a one year a one-year uh, treasury. It's a 2%, and in six months, we expect a 50 basis point cut uh, so that the Fed funds rate would be 1.5. Basically, for six months uh, uh, of the year, we're going to have a 2%. If we bought a six-month and then rolled it over to a six-month, we'd have a 2% six-month and a 1.5% six-month. What would the one year have to be to be indifferent between that? <clears throat> uh, half the time, we'd be getting 2%. Uh, plus half the time we'd be getting 1.5 percent, and if you uh, uh, if you weight those out, you get 1. Point, uh, uh, sorry, 1.75 percent. So uh, this is 2 percent. A one year is 1.75 percent. That implies a 50 basis point cut somewhere in 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 the uh, halfway uh, through that period. Fed meetings are distributed uniformly across time. <clears throat> so 25 basis points implies 55 uh, a 50 cut. So if you have a, um, a one year at 4% and the rate at 5.33, that's 133 basis points down. Once you weight everything, that implies 266 basis points of cuts. Uh, I checked my email, have not received any emails about that subject. Maybe it's because I'm already an applied level. Yeah, it's because you're already applied level. You were all taken out and uh, yeah, already adjusted. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Definitely in your camp of starting with 50 seems excessive, and this OMC likes retaining optionality. I just read Nick Timmer's Wall Street Journal piece, Fed Rate Cut Dilemma. I don't think it's a dilemma for the Fed. <clears throat> I don't think it's a dilemma for the Fed. I think it's a dilemma for the market, but I don't think it's a dilemma for the Fed. I don't think any of them were talking about 50 going in. I'm taking pause, but I wonder if his piece has enough sway for the Fed Watch tool to show 
Wouldn't it be out of character for the Fed to make a fifty? <clears throat> it would be out of it would be out of character. Uh, <clears throat> last Q and A when I asked how can I be a numbers person, you said don't be a numbers person. <clears throat> uh, this question actually arised because I heard a lot of professionals talk they have to be good with numbers, so I assumed you got to be good with numbers to be good in finance. No. No, you don't. You don't have to be good with numbers. Uh, to be good in finance you 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 have to be you have to have a strategic mind you have to be able to see opportunity and you can make a qualitative argument uh, for why a stock will go in a particular direction you don't have to uh, you don't have to have some price target and do a lot of math and besides the math uh, I'll, I'll give you all the operations you need you need to be able to add you need to be able to subtract you should be able to multiply, and if you can divide, that's pretty good as well. <clears throat> there you go. Everything you learned in, in, in grade school, uh, you have all the two. You can take a six-year-old, and, and they can do finance math, you know, at least for what you need in the market. Uh, it's, there, there's, there's no calculus. Uh, there's, there's, you know, uh, no. I don't know that, that beyond that, I don't think that, uh, <clears throat> that you have to know very much. He talked about generalist and specialist and how many sectors you should be or aim to be a specialist in. That's a statement, not a question. I don't know what the question there is. What is passive trading? You told me in last q and means you just buy an ETF that tracks an index. Do you care who asks good questions or not? Do you care? Well, do I care who asks? Um, not really. Not really. <clears throat> uh, there, are, there are no bad questions. There are just um, uh, there are questions. Sometimes I read where I just don't even know what the question is, or the question's just too broad to be answered. Not that it's a bad question. It's just that it's you know uh, sometimes not clear exactly what the question is, or the question is just so big there is no there is no way to answer it in any reasonable way because it would require me to sort of guess you know what part of that whole universe of answers you're looking at and and would want different ways of shorting a stock that has very that has very liquid options how do you decide between shorting stock directly versus using options um well you can short the stock but you have to look at the borrow rate right uh, uh if the borrow rate is very high it's expensive to short the stock you also have to look at the uh, ability to short the stock. Maybe your broker has no inventory to lend you or very little inventory, which means it'll be called away from you. Um, <clears throat> buying a put is the easiest thing to do. Buying a put uh, and selling a call creates a synthetic. If you do it at the same strike, uh, that can't be called away from you, but it does expire. However, it doesn't have a borrow cost associated with it. I use IBKR, and if I understand correctly, the cash I get from shorting stocks directly offsets the cost of borrowing those. No, it doesn't. No, 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 it doesn't. No, you still must pay a borrow rate. So you short a stock, 100% of the proceeds uh, are um, restricted. You can't touch that. Uh, plus, you have to add another 30%. You have to have another 30% in your account. So if you short a $100 stock, uh, uh, you need $130. 100 will come from the sale of the stock. $30 will be yours. And then if the borrow rate is 5%, you must pay the other side 5% per year uh, based, on, <clears throat> based on the value of that stock. If you're right and the price goes down, well, the 5%, it's 5% of a dropping and dropping amount. Uh, and that is, uh, that is restricted money. Now, you can depending on on how important you are i guess the size of your account you can opt to put this in uh you know 30-day t-bills so that it earns uh it earns a risk-free rate and that may offset the uh the borrow cost <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> wti what are your thoughts on uh cushing tank farm have continued draws and are now around 24.7 million barrels. It's approaching operational low of 20 million uh, barrels. 
Um, yeah, I don't. I I haven't looked into um, into that issue. Uh, I mean, I don't know. You're telling me this now, so it's like, oh, okay. Well, there's there's information that I wasn't using before. Um, <clears throat> I don't really do really deep dives on on the oil market. It's it's not really my thing. Um, so, uh, Doomberg uh, is really good at that. The the green chicken. Doom was it Berg or Berg? Doomberg Doomberg. If you want to get a lot better. Uh, you know, energy space analysis. He's really good. I say he. It, I don't know if he's using a voice synthesizer to create a voice, but it's a chicken. It's a green chicken. My move from NVIDIA into REITs is proving worth it. Wondering if you could cover any warning signs I should watch for that suggest fall in REIT prices. Uh, you know, you really should be doing this yourself, right? Uh, don't outsource your thinking to me all the time. Uh, I mean, that's not what, what I'm trying to get done here. Uh, if you have the applied level, there are videos on, on understanding REITs. You should, you should be learning and understanding enough about it that you would know what your own, what your own warning signs are <clears throat> of that. But, uh, if, you know, I don't want to be your, your money manager, uh, and, and, you know, looking to me for, you know, should I sell? Should I buy? Should I sell? I really, I really don't want to get involved in that. Thoughts on GM having declining vehicle sales. Yeah. Revenues have grown. Shows the increase in revenue is only driven by higher vehicle prices. Well, it doesn't necessarily have to mean higher vehicle prices. It could mean higher trim uh, and uh, just higher priced uh, products so you know a move from you know low trim to high trim from compact vehicles to mid-size and even uh, you know SUV so the mix doesn't necessarily just mean higher prices period but there have been there have been higher prices inflation decelerates do you see that there's a risk for lower revenues <clears throat> well that's what would happen that's what that's what you know, uh, deflation would be, would be lower revenues. Disinflation would be lower growth in revenues if there's no real component. Real meaning, you know, more product being moved. But that's what deflation would do. It would result in, in, in lower revenues. <clears throat> Worried looking fella at 32. Uh, well, it's because money market, uh, uh, you know, funds keep attracting uh, more assets under management. <clears throat> if you have markets hitting all-time highs, if you have gold hitting all-time highs, if you have uh, yields that are dropping and bonds going up, why does money need to be in a safe in a safe security? <clears throat> money market uh, funds represent, you know, it's a barometer of, of, of safety, uh, and you have that going up. So there's a greater and greater demand week after week for safety, and it seems to only go in one direction. Yet you have all these asset classes hitting all-time highs. One of those two things are wrong. It is either wrong to put all that money into money market funds, or it is wrong to push these uh, to push these asset classes to newer and newer highs. One of them must be wrong. You put money in money market mutual funds <clears throat> just to watch the stock market hit all-time highs week after week after week. Clearly, that was the wrong thing to do, right? Unless that money going into money market funds is moving there in anticipation of something. Uh, month over month, export prices decline more than import prices. Uh, yeah, you got to look at the mix of what's being imported versus what's being exported. It's not like it's the same thing. So it could be that, that what is being uh, exported is more price sensitive than what is being imported. Right? When you calculate return on an options trade using margin required and not the full collateral, as you often say, you would take delivery of the underlying implying that you have the cash need for full underlying. If you have the cash need, why not calculate the option return using that instead? And it gets complicated. 
because let's say that uh, uh, to buy something is ten thousand dollars, but I only need three thousand uh, dollars for the option, which leaves me seven thousand dollars. That's earning a risk-free rate. Do I include the amount that I'm earning on the seven thousand along with the premium and use the ten thousand as a denominator? Right. So <clears throat> that just starts to get really complicated. So you know, it's easier just to calculate it as a percentage of the margin required. You can say, but that's not the, the right measurement. It doesn't matter if it's the right measurement. As long as I use a consistent measurement, it doesn't have to be the right measurement. So if I measure something the same way all the time, uh, I have comparability across all the measures, even if, even if the measurement I'm using is not quite right. I still would have precision in my comparability across different, different uh, you know, I could, you know, sell... Uh, puts on this one, on this one, on this one. Uh, I can compare, uh, you know, the desirability of those based on the premium to the margin required. Even if you think, well, that's not exactly the right way to do it, it wouldn't matter as long as I'm consistent. Um, you say that typically a curve is in contango when there's oversupply. Typically, yeah. However, markets are forward-looking. Wouldn't this CL curve be in contango now? Speculators are forecasting supply glut. <clears throat> Forecasters uh, are uh, uh, in in backwardation. Uh, they are forecasting a supply glut. So you have your spot price. You have your futures price. The next futures price is lower. The next futures price is lower. The next futures price is lower because it's expected that uh, supply will increase, which will drive the spot price down so that the curve starts looking like this. Uh, once it, it once it gets steep enough, what this is saying, if the spot price is here and the futures here, is the next one is over here saying, well, at these low prices, supply is going to get cut, which means the spot price will eventually lift up. And this is what the curve does. It goes from backwardation into contango, into a flat curve, into contango. And then, of course, it looks for equilibrium and it goes back in the back, you know, sorry, back in a contango, back in the backwardation, back in a contango. And that is the game that is played. It is, you know, moving in and around the equilibrium point. If supply equal demand and supply was always expected to equal demand, uh, you would have a curve that would be fairly, fairly flat. Uh, if the risk-free rate equaled the cost of storage and you had supply equaling demand such that there was no convenience yield, you'd have a flat, a flat forward curve. A market in perfect equilibrium uh, but markets uh, uh, move in and around equilibrium and the spot price tells us what we should expect from the behavior of the suppliers uh, that if if you have a curve in backwardation uh, we would expect that companies would be motivated to produce more of the product uh, and as they produce more of the product and that's why the next month has a lower price because we expect well there'll be more supply and then more supply and at these high prices less demand and more supply until the price drops down then we start thinking the other way well at these low prices and with a lot of supply taken off the market we expect that the price will have to start to increase because demand will be increasing here and supply will be decreasing and so we dance how did CL go negative in 2020? If the spot at the time was, I think, around 20. Uh, it was the futures that went negative, uh, and it went negative because of a um, USO, mostly USO, at least it was blamed on that. Uh, the structure of the way they held contracts, they were rolling a bunch of their contracts, which caused uh, some price dislocation in that market, which then caused a cascading uh, effect for a whole bunch of people who were rolling. Plus, the price was already dropping at that time and fear started going, you know, like I was watching it at the time. I watched it broke 10, 9, 8, 7. Then, then the price just disappeared because Interactive Brokers wasn't set up to print negative prices. So it just disappeared under the bottom of the chart for a while. You had no idea where it was. It was um, <clears throat> pretty interesting. You could try to throw a bid out there to buy at the market, but IB defaults to zero. Uh, well, why buy it at zero if it was negative? You'd immediately have a loss. So you couldn't even take advantage of it. How do you size large currency conversions? 
uh, how do I size a conversion? I guess how much money do you need? If you're converting, you're you're changing one currency into another, right? Mostly interested in U.S. markets and bonds long term. It's just that FX is notoriously difficult to forecast. Wonder if I should time it at all? Nah, eh, not really. Even for large positions, given today's economic situation, where interest rate parity. Mm. As well as future cuts are priced in, recent decline in oil prices. I know I can go long synthetic, however, I do want to stay in U.S. market long term, prefer U.S., then that's where you are. <clears throat> yeah, there is no easy answer uh, when uh, you bring currencies into the mix to hedge or not to hedge, uh, to stay at home or to uh, uh, go into foreign markets to buy uh, the currency or use options instead. Uh, that's you know, there is no easy answer for that. And if you get an easy answer for that, I guarantee you, 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 you would have a long list of clients who would be willing to pay you for that solution. Uh, there is no easy answer for that. None at all. So this is why I don't really like this, this home country bias uh, thing that, uh, that, that finance seems to cling to sometimes. Lots of papers about the home country bias. So many investors display a home country bias. They're not diversified internationally enough. It's like, well, once you include the, with, with the withholding tax that other countries charge, once you include the extra risk of adding on the currency, it's not a home country bias. It's an aversion to those types of risks, right? But uh, there is no easy answer to that question. Eight uh, five for an investment advisory firm. Open a paper portfolio with IB as I go through the applied options curriculum, but I cannot trade during market hours as I'm at work. How do you recommend getting live market experience for someone in my shoes? Hmm. Maybe it's just not your game. Um, um, you can set up uh, trades, um, you know, that can execute during the day. You can set them up at night saying, well, given that the stock is here, the option closed at this price, I'm going to put an option, you know, uh, an order to sell this put at this price and, and it'll just execute on its own. If, if, if they're hit, those prices will just execute on their own. Uh, but if you can't uh, trade, uh, you know, like it has a, a phone app, so next time you walk out the, the door to go to Starbucks to pick up a coffee, it takes like two minutes to check in and say, okay, well, I'll do this, I'll do that. It's not like you got to sit there for half an hour. I mean, executing a, a phony trade is just paper portfolio. I don't think you need to clear that through, through uh, uh, a compliance uh, at all. Um, that, you know, go to the bathroom, <laughs> right? And just uh, sit in the stall for three minutes, uh, do what you got to do and head back out. Modeling an upstream oil and gas producer hedges over 50% of its natural gas production, 20% of its oil. Uh, I'd like to present a few scenarios. When calculating revenue, would you recommend incorporating gains and losses from derivative contracts? Uh, no, I, I think you could just, uh, you could just, uh, if they're hedging, I mean, they, they must, uh, they must tell you, uh, Obviously, they're using the front month or the second front month. If they're using futures, if they're using forward agreements, mm, then it's a matter of, uh, you know, you're probably not going to know what price they're hedging at. Yeah. So it's not my, um, this is, the, that's not my area of expertise at all. Um, if I were given something like that, I would certainly be calling some people I know and saying, look, uh, how would you deal with this situation? Uh, which is what you're doing here with me, but I don't know. I don't know that I would get involved with the derivatives, gains, and losses. If you have the wherewithal to calculate the gain and loss on the derivative, you must know the strike price of the contract, in which case I would just book that as revenue. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't book higher revenue but show a loss on the derivative or book lower revenue and show a gain on the derivative. I'd just collapse them into one thing and say, well, look, if they hedge 50% of their of their production what you can do and i guess this would be a fair enough thing to do you're i guess you're doing monthly or quarterly but let's say you're doing quarterly is uh, look at the uh, oil futures curve and whatever the price is you know figure out what their production volume is going to be uh, over those months and then uh, if they're hedging 50 percent 
Take 50% of your production times that price, 50% times that price, 50% times that price, and you have two lines. You have hedged revenue and unhedged uh, revenue. Uh, and then this would be the price, uh, this would be the quantity, like 50% of that would be the quantity, and we know our revenue is P times Q. So you just price it out on that futures curve, and then for the unhedged, uh, so this is the problem with the unhedged, usually you would use the same, the same curve, right? You'd use, you'd typically, uh, uh, for any producer, you'd typically price it out on some forward curve or some futures curve, and then if you if you disagree with the curve you can you can make some adjustments to it but you certainly wouldn't be trying to project out the price of oil i mean that's a whole different game you're getting into is modeling out the price of oil you just whatever firm you work for would typically have a commodities department would would give you their forecast for what the forward curve would look like and you'd use that so i think hedged or unhedged why not sell 100% of it on the, on the forward curve? I guess that's what I would do. When projecting out multiple years. Uh, CL. Um, if it's WTI, CL is, uh, has got contracts out for like two years. So you have a fairly, fairly good forward curve for a couple years. Uh, and after a certain point, it kind of goes flat. Like, you know, the curve, if it's in backwardation, it does this. It doesn't just keep dropping. It tends to just go flat. And at some point, you could just use a constant price. Why do you feel important to tell about vehicle sales? Well, because I'm long GM. So, you, you know, you do want to keep a look, uh, you know, look at the, the what the size of the market is because GM has a certain market share. If the uh, vehicle sales are dropping, for GM to hold their sales constant, either they'd have to move their mix up, their trim up, or their market share up, right? So uh, if we have vehicle sales that are rising and GM's market share is held constant, its sales would be rising as well. So it's just one, one piece of a big puzzle. Money market inflows can be justified by September seasonality effect. Yeah, but uh, money's been flowing in the money markets almost every week uh, for quite some time, not just for September. Any videos, uh, listen to your YouTube channel where you explain step by step how to read the macroeconomic indicators that you walk us through in your weekly market. Up. Yeah, understanding the market outlook. Just uh, go to my channel and uh, type in understanding the market outlook. It'll walk you through what all those screens mean. Uh, your subscribers in Europe are craving the day uh, when MM live sessions are held in the afternoon. Oh, that's a thought, right? Instead of doing it at 7.15 p.m., do it at like 2 p.m. in the afternoon. I guess I could do that. I guess I could try one at 2 p.m. and see what happens. Yeah, I'll think about that. Uh, Costco video, learn to apply. Uh, I think I started reading targets 10k, but they clearly mentioned they expect revenue go by 4% per year. Should I dive into that more? Is it the best revenue? I'd probably say 4% for targets probably the best thing because they probably don't have an aggressive store opening uh, um, um, capital uh, campaign. Costco does uh, targeting 25 to 30 new stores per year, new warehouses per year. <clears throat> so it is it they have comparable sales, but that's just for existing warehouses. You have to consider that uh, the pool of warehouses increases each year, whereas Target probably has a, a number of stores and probably doesn't have a, a, an aggressive campaign on opening new stores, which means uh, uh, their top line revenue or their uh, sales is probably all comparable. So if they say 4%, job done. Use management guidance, job done. <clears throat> Uh, July, I already answered that. Why is it bearish if CL moves uh, more into contango? It's not because the curve moves into contango. It's uh, the spot price would drop significantly such that the futures price is now above the spot. That's the bearish part, is that if you're here and the curve looks like this and the price drops, it will drag the front month down and make the curve uh, inverted, uh, um, not inverted, but upward sloping like that. That's the bearish part. Not the curve in contango being bearish, but the dropping of the spot price pulling the curve into contango. That's the bearish part. 
JP Morgan and City expect 50. Expect or want, <laughs> right? Expect or want. Can't the increase in money markets not be reinvestment of distributions? Uh, it could. It just has been going up faster than the, than the interest rate. So I don't know if it's, you know, I mean, sure, it could be all of those things. Uh, it's just that if you have, as I said earlier, all these markets hitting all-time highs, why is money hiding in safety? Uh, short, I'll already answer that. <clears throat> Many market participants quoting headline inflation number when convenient. At times it counts, at times it doesn't. Yeah, you can, there's enough data out there that you can make any story you want work. Do you think being an investor helps you as an entrepreneur and vice versa? Yeah, I do. Uh, I do. Yeah. And uh, there we go for this week.